you'll turn in your Bibles to Proverbs 3. Proverbs 3. Begin by saying Happy Father's Day to our fathers. <clears throat> We're always appreciative of good parents and not too long ago we honored and acknowledged our mothers and we are very thankful for our mothers and today is Father's Day and we do indeed appreciate all that our fathers have done for us. We appreciate the men of this congregation and, and the work that they do and, and how they have raised their children as well. I didn't do a specific sermon on Mother's Day for Mother's Day and today I do a sermon from Proverbs 3 which could be entitled Lessons from a Father primarily because it is Lessons from a Father <laughs> but I think we could look at it too from a standpoint of parenting these are lessons from our parents. These are godly lessons that parents should teach their children. This is a sermon that is for parents, fathers, mothers. It's a sermon that's about parents, fathers, mothers. It's for children and their responsibility to their parents. It's about children and their response to their parents. And so this is a sermon which really encompasses the family unit. And we need more sermons on the family today. The family is under attack by the world. The family unit, as described by God, as defined in the very beginning as one man and one woman and their children, that describes a family. And when it comes to religious matters, it's extremely important to properly define a, a, a family because God uses that picture of a father and a husband and a bride and children and family to, to represent the relationship that we have in His church. The, rep, the relationship that we have in salvation is given by God as a picture or compared to that of a family. And if you change the definition of a family, you totally mess up the picture God has given us about the church. <laughs> I mean, you totally mess it up. And so it's important. Ephesians chapter 6, hold your place there in Proverbs 4. <clears throat> but in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 1 through verse 4 the Bible says children obey your parents in the Lord for this is right honor thy father and mother which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with thee and thou mayest live long on the earth fathers provoke not your children to wrath but bring them up in the nurture of an admonition of the Lord. <clears throat> a very succinct summation of the family unit. Parents are to obey God. They are to transmit what they learn from God to their children. And their children are to grow up being nurtured and admonished in according to God's will. And we see this, lessons from this in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 through verse 12. Solomon, the inspired author, also a father. And of course, the inspired of God, who refers to himself as a holy father. The relationship then is one of great importance. That God would picture Himself to help us understand 
who He is with our finite minds to use the comparison of a father because we get that. We see that in physical life. He uses things that we can see to help us know more about spiritual things. And the family unit is one of those things. And He refers to Himself as Father. Jesus the Christ as His only begotten Son who prayed to God calling Him Father. The relationship between a father and a son sin. And this comparison helps us to see our relationship with God. This places a great, grave responsibility on men who become fathers. Does it not? That God used that position in life as a comparison to who He is in relationship to His people. I read or heard somewhere, I believe a child psychiatrist of some sort, and of course, uh, I'm not big on psychiatrists and things of that nature. If you need some help, go to the Bible. (laughs) But, this individual made a comment that may or may not be true, but I think it does help us understand the grave responsibility of a father being that God uses that nomenclature to represent Himself. The individual said, in reference to small children, little children, whose minds have not matured, they don't think logically, they don't think rationally, uh, they're not matured enough to think in that way. Okay. So how do they learn? They learn by comparison. They learn by comparison. And with that in mind, this individual said, no small child can think more of God than he does of his own father. You know, when we teach small children, we say, we show them a picture of a car. And we say, this is a car. And they point at it and say, car, right? Now, they have no idea what a car is. But they've seen a picture of it. They've, they can, and they can go out and we can say, this is a car. What is that? And the child can respond, that's a car. Well, they know it's a car, but they don't have any idea what a car is. Right? We don't go through a, a, a great description of what a car is. We just say, here's the picture of it. That's what it is. Right? <coughs> and they get that. As they grow older, they might understand uh, cylinders and shocks and axles, right? Lug nuts. They might start to learn those things later, but up until then, they don't know what a, what comprises a car. They just know what it is by comparison. And so, if when we teach our children that God is our Father in heaven, what's the first thing that comes to their mind when we say Father? Most likely, it's their physical father. And imagine if their father is someone who is harsh or unhappy, or maybe is an addict of some sort, drugs, alcohol. How might that child make that comparison between their father and God? It distorts it, doesn't it? On the other hand, a a father can help their child grow up and understand God when he is happy, when he is good, when he is kind, when he is honest, he doesn't lie to his child, when he's caring, when he's protective, even if that requires discipline at times, and we'll get into that in just a moment. You can see the comparison though. That child will grow up with a better understanding of what of who God is, right? Because of the comparison. So there is a grave responsibility on men who are called fathers. Because of that, you become the image of what that, you become the picture. <laughs> Who is God? Well, He's my Father. Right? And they, we have to make a distinction between a spiritual or a heavenly Father and a physical Father. But still, they hear Father and they think of that relationship. And the reason is, that's the way God wanted it. 
God wants us to look at Him as a Father. And we understand that relationship because we grew up in it. We understand that family union. Or we ought to be able to. So in Proverbs chapter 3, Solomon writes, My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Now that's what Paul said in Ephesians 6, 1-4. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them upon thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. And so shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. <clears throat> the first lesson that this father tried to communicate to his children was do what I say to do. Right? Do what I say to do. My son, forget not my law. parents try at a very early age hopefully to train their children that there are boundaries and doing that isn't uh, easy I'm sure <laughs> even for adults it's hard to ask adults to form boundaries where they don't want them people feel like they're giving up freedom and I suppose in a sense they are they're giving up the freedom to live as they wish. To live as they desire. But look what they gain. The opportunity for heaven. To fulfill one's own fleshly desires is to lead oneself to hell. People have the freedom to go to hell. People have the right to go to hell. But nobody in their right mind who has the ability to think would choose that direction. They would choose the lessons Solomon is presenting here. Don't forget my law. Because it will lengthen your days, it will bring you long life, it will bring you peace. But that doesn't mean that life's going to be easy and hunky-dory all the time, is it? But the most peaceful life the life that would lead to a long life is when a parent teaches God's Word to their child. We've heard fathers and parents say, as long as you live under my, rule, or under my roof, you'll obey my rules. That's good instruction. It teaches boundaries. And when Solomon wrote this, just like any parent, the parent would want to explain why the rules exist. These rules are here to help you. These rules are to help you grow and to make sure that you have a good life. When Solomon wrote so many of the Proverbs, he had first-hand experience of being asked, what do you want from a father? Did he? <laughs> and what did he tell God? He said, God, I want wisdom. And because of that, God gave him wisdom and all the wealth that he could handle and more. And so Solomon, in writing these things by inspiration, knew firsthand the, the importance of wisdom. And he knew that wisdom was more than just knowledge. It was knowledge put to practice. This was a topic very close to the heart of Solomon, seeing that he had asked for these things as a new king. And he knew that his knowledge that led to his wisdom was based upon rules and boundaries. The definition of what right is and what wrong is. What kind of world would we live in if we didn't know the definition of what right is? But today, not only is the home under attack, the very definition of right and wrong is under attack. We can read just a few verses in the Proverbs to see Solomon's passion for wisdom and the need to pass that on to children. 
In Proverbs 1.8, he says, My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. In chapter 2, verse 1, My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, incline thine ear to wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding. If thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures. Then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. The fear of the Lord. In Ecclesiastes, towards the end of Solomon's life, he would say in chapter 12, verse 13, this is the whole conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep His commandments. Fear God and keep His commandments. How do we fear the Lord? Find wisdom. Chapter 5, verse 1. Well, chapter 4, verse 1. Hear ye children the instruction of a father and attend to no understanding. Chapter 5, verse 1. My son, attend to my wisdom and bow thine ear to my understanding. Chapter 7, verse 1. My son, keep my words and lay up my commandments with thee. Keep my commandments and live and my law is the apple of thine eye. Rules are there for a reason. Parents give rules for a reason. They want what's best for their children. They want what's best for us. They want us to have a good life. They know that that's dependent upon hearing truth and hearing good words, listening and obeying. Good boundaries are a way in which we can protect ourselves and bring peace. When people feel secure in themselves, they seem to increase their boundaries, don't they? After a while, you live on a certain street, the kids run around and play in the road, maybe they shoot basketball on the street, they get comfortable, right? But the parent says, look both ways. Look both ways before you cross the street. Why? Because that's good information. But when that child gets so comfortable and they don't look both ways, there's a consequence, isn't there? And that's why parents keep saying it. Look both ways. Look both ways. Hold my hand. Hold my hand. Boundaries are there for a reason to protect us, to keep us safe. Some boundaries are given so that we don't have to have fear of harm. Secondly, in verse 5 through 8 of chapter 3, Solomon says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding, First, Solomon says, listen to me. Do what I tell you to do, right? And then he says, trust in God. Hear what God has to say. Adults, children, parents, whoever you are, you might think you know everything, but you don't, right? Kids grow up and they get to a point, right, where they think they know everything. Well, some people never grow out of that. <laughs> if you think you know everything, you don't. You need to ask God. You need to trust in God. That's the reason the Bible says obey your parents in the Lord. Your parents are supposed to be obeying the Lord. If your parents aren't obeying the Lord, then their commands may not be right. Their boundaries may not be right. Indivi many individuals have had to get out of their own household to find out the truth. To find the truth. To find what's right. To, to read the Bible for themselves so that they can trust in the Lord. They may have not had the godly parents that some of us have been so blessed to have. They weren't taught those things from a young age but they did have a holy heavenly Father that they could go to and trust in Him. If you 
parents are obeying God, then their instruction is going to lead us in the right direction. And any parent today ought to be practicing what he preaches, trusting in the Lord, teaching only the commands that God would have him to command. None of this do as I say, not as I do. Right? Verse 6, In all thy ways acknowledge God, and He shall direct thy paths. Solomon's instructing his children, I'm not always right. Don't blame me. Right? If I'm wrong, trust God. Because He's never wrong. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. Listen to God. These rules and commands that parents give their children ought to be commands and rules that come from God. God gives us commands as His people. To be a child of God, we must obey those commands. We must submit to those commands. We must never think that we know it all. Sin is when we cross the boundaries that God has presented. 1 John 3 verse 4. Sin is a transgression of law. Sin leads to death. It leads to separation from God. It can lead to a life of uncertainty. Romans 6 verse 23. That's not what God wants. That's not what godly parents want. They want us to have a good life, a secure life. One with hope. The only way that's going to happen is if we trust in the Lord and let Him direct our paths. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. Matthew 11, 28 verse 30. But we have to take that yoke upon us. We have to learn of Him. <coughs> Excuse me. And we have to decide how much do I want to obey God? How much do I want God in my life? Truly, this question is, do I want God in my life? Right? Because a lot of people say, well, of course I want God in my life. But they, they, they incrementalize it out. right? I want a little bit of God, but not a whole lot of God. Some people say, well, I'll have a little bit of God on Sunday and a little bit of God on Wednesday. Right? People want to incrementalize God. You either got God or you ain't. You either obey God or you don't. You either choose God or you choose self and the devil. People have to decide, right? And if you decide you don't want God, you don't want God. But if you decide you want God, then you need to listen to what He says and do it. You need to be His child. Will you decide to follow Him or will you choose to decide, uh, follow yourself? Will you lean to your own understanding? Solomon says, don't be wise in your own eyes. Most people like to rationalize sins and call sin, well, that's not as bad as he does or I'm not as bad as she is. This sin was, it really, I had to do it. Some people say I had to do it. <laughs> right? They rationalize their sin. Or some people say, well, that's just who I am. That's just who I am. Well, if that's just who you are, you'll go to hell. Just who you are. <laughs> if you want to go to heaven, you're going to have to change. If, you're, if, you're, if your personality is in contradiction to God, you need to change your personality and quit saying, that's just who I am. You need to quit being that and start being someone new. Some people like to justify themselves. Ah, that's just who I am. That's my personality. Your personality should not be counter to what God wants. If it is, we need to change. Some people say, well, if it makes me feel good, if it makes me happy, God wants me to be happy. I heard this in the Walmart just the other day. Well, there's some truth to that. God wants us to be happy. But they were talking about homosexuality. And the idea was God's loving God. Well, sure He is. But God hates sin. God hates sin. But people rationalize their sin, right? God's a loving God. Therefore, I can be a homosexual. 
That was the idea presented in the aisle across from where I was. I wasn't eavesdropping, I just heard it. But you hear that all over the place, right? Stuff like that. People misuse John chapter 2 and say, well, the Lord turned water into wine. As if Jesus was a drunkard, an alcoholic. Shame on those people. Don't rationalize sin. Listen to God. Listen to His rules. Listen to His commands. Follow His boundaries. Be happy. Have hope. That's what the Father, Solomon, encourages us to do. If we trust God, we'll trust God to do what's right in His eyes, not what's right in our eyes. In Hosea, chapter 13, verse 1 and 2, God through His prophet says, When Ephraim, speaking about Israel, spake trembling, He exalted Himself in Israel. Right? But when He offended in Baal, He died. And now, notice verse 2. Now they sin more and more. Why? Because they rationalize sin number one. It wasn't that bad. And then they say, well, if that's not too bad, we can push the boundary a little farther. Well, that's not too bad anymore, so we can push the boundary a little farther. Well, after a while, that's not so bad, so they push the boundary even farther. And now God says they keep sinning more and more and more. And they made them molten images of silver and idols according to their own understanding. What did, this, what did Solomon say? Don't lean on your own understanding. <clears throat> Lesson number three, I suppose. Is seen in verses 9 and 10. An interesting lesson. And I'll try to speed up. In verse 9 and 10, he says, Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall bur burst out with new wine. It's interesting that in a father's discussion of wisdom and instruction of how to live and be peaceful and have a good life and a happy life and be right with God that he says honor God with your money honor God with your substance with your wealth you know why would he put that in there a lot of people would say well that, what, putting money matters in the middle of this just makes no sense but does it you know, the, the majority of problems in this world are over money. Paul told Timothy, 1 Timothy 6, verse 10, that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. So what did Solomon tell his son? Don't love money. Honor God with your substance. Don't look at your money as something that is only a tool for you. Look first and foremost at how you can do good with it. Honor God with it. Do what's right with it. Not just, not just in giving back to God, but, but that's part of it, giving back to God. But how do we, do we do what's right with our money? Do we do what's right with our substance? Or do we let our substance become our God, you see? <laughs> Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, not on earth, Jesus said. But a lot of people find trouble because they place their trust in their money and their substance, not in God. They view money as only a tool for pleasure for themselves. How many people have gotten into money problems and that caused problem after problem after problem? Solomon didn't want that for his children, so he wanted to teach them about how to take care of their money and their finances. Think of God first. Then your barns will be filled. Honoring the Lord with our wealth is about trust. 
Do we, do we trust in God? Or do we trust in ourselves? It's about worship. Giving is an act of worship today. It's a way in which we do good for the Lord's cause. Do we put God first in our giving? Many marriages have broken up because of money. <laughs> Many fights have been started because of money. The majority of lawsuits in the country are probably over money. That's the reason at a young age Solomon said money is important. Jesus even said if you don't work, you don't eat. We have to take care of ourselves. We have to provide for ourselves. The Bible says that a father who doesn't earn a living and take care of his family is worse than an infidel. So the Bible tells us we have to work, we have to have wages, we have to have money. But what, what's our view of that money? Right? Is it something for us or is it a way to do honor God? Everything comes from somewhere and you know where it comes from? God. Everything comes from God. All good blessings come from God. We wouldn't have anything if it weren't for God. Lastly, verse 11 and verse 12, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of His correction. For whom the Lord loveth, He correcteth, even as a father the son in whom he delighteth. Discipline is good. Parents need to discipline their children. God said, I discipline my children as a father to a son. Right? The Lord loveth. For whom the Lord loveth, He correcteth. Now correction starts with teaching. Here's what you did wrong. Here's why it's wrong. Here's what you need to do right, right? Here's the definition of right, and here's the definition of wrong. Right? You don't start with capital or corporal punishment. Right? <laughs> you don't start with spanking or you don't start with the death penalty. Right? You start with education, you start with teaching. That's how discipline begins. You train your child, you discipline your child. God disciplines us. He teaches us. He tells us what He wants us to do. He tells us how to be right in His sight. But then, when we do what's wrong, He corrects us. Correction can be done by teaching, rebuke, reproof, exhortation, preaching. Right? And then, of course, if we don't hear and we don't correct, there can be other means of punishment. God hurts when we have to be chastened and punished. It doesn't hurt Him in the sense that it hurts us. But He hurts because we've separated ourselves from Him. Right? We hurt God when we sin. He doesn't want us to have to be punished, but He loves us enough to punish us. The punishment is for the same reason as the admonishment to put us back on the right track. Children need to know that the discipline given may seem more severe than the crime, but it is done with the reason of showing them consequences. And parents can show them the description or definition of right and wrong. Parents who love their kids will correct their children just as God loves us and will correct us. His, his means of punishment might be allowing me to go through the consequences of some sin I have committed. It might be allowing me to go through some terrible event. But if I allow those things to lead me to Him, it will have all been worth it. Correction is good. Discipline is good. These are lessons from a father, Solomon. Now, as we have studied and not too long ago in some Bible classes, Solomon didn't listen to his own wisdom, did he, at times? His sons rejected some of this wisdom too, didn't they? And we see the consequences. 
These are good lessons. They're good lessons for parents. They're good lessons about parents. They're good lessons for children. They're good lessons about children. It's lessons for us all, isn't it? <laughs> because as we pointed out at the beginning, God has pointed out our relationship with Him as a father-son relationship. And we need to know these things in order to be right with God. God has made being right with Him quite simple today. It's based upon faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God, Romans 10, verse 17. Our faith leads us to repent of past sin because that put Jesus on the cross, Luke 13, verse 3, to confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, Acts 8, 36 and 37, and to obey the command of being baptized in water in order to have our past sins washed away, Acts 22, verse 16. The Bible says the Lord adds to His church those who are saved, Acts 2, verse 47, those who are being saved, those who obey the gospel, those who have repented, confessed, and been baptized are added to His church. And if we'll remain faithful as a son to a father, obeying His commands, trusting Him, living in accordance with His will, when He sends back His Son to receive His church, we will be able to go home and be with Him in eternity, Ephesians 5, verse 27. If you've already obeyed those initial acts but have something separating you from God, take care of that today before it's too late. Whatever your need is, come now as we stand and sing.